you know, sitting down on this, uh, this stool here, um, I'm kind of semi-reminded by um, a fellow named Mr. Rogers, Mr. Fred Rogers, who it's hard to believe he's been gone for, <clears throat> for 20 years now, almost. He died in 2003, the year I moved to Los Angeles, I remember that. But, um, you know, sitting here, sometimes I, you know, cross my legs or whatever, but um, I feel like I want to do something with my, uh, my shoe here. But, uh, you know, toss it from one hand to the other. Every time I sit down, there's like this little, in the back of my mind, I think about Fred Rogers and the way he used to sit down in his very humble uh, studio, better decorated than my, my home, maybe. But um, we talk about doing things for low budget. If you're familiar with Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, in that show that ran for what about about 30 years or more um, on uh, public television, uh, you know if you're familiar with public television, you definitely know the fact that they don't have budgets very much of the time. They have very shoestring budgets, but it's amazing what they produce. It's better than <laughs> often better than uh, the productions, you know, Hollywood type productions that that actually have a budget. And Fred was incredibly anti Hollywood, but you know it really did not stop him from from doing what he wanted to do. And thinking of another guy who was kind of anti-Hollywood, that would be George Clayton Johnson, who um, throughout his career, although he certainly had his Hollywood, you know, his, his name was in the marquee a few times, with Ocean's Eleven and Logan's Run and of course Twilight Zone. Um, not to mention the, the stories that he, that he wrote. But he himself really led a very humble sort of existence. Um, and everybody who, who knew him, knew of that about him, and maybe even respected him more for just the kind of uh, issuing that, that, that Hollywood stereotype, despite the fact that he had Hollywood credits. So um, George Clayton Johnson was, uh, you know, as I say, a unique, a unique personality. And although he only wrote four episodes and then stories for four more episodes that were that had teleplays done by others. I have there is no doubt at all in my mind that Rod Serling would give him the credit for knowing the Twilight Zone even better than Rod himself or any of the other writers did. And he just had one of the most brilliant minds imaginable and it didn't come really I think you know you can be born with a certain amount of talent, but then the rest of it has to be developed. There are plenty of people out there, it's like the world is full of genius, but not all of the genius is necessarily developed. And although George was not a scholar, or, or to my knowledge, a college graduate, he just he knew so much about so many things. And whenever I think about George, I think of you know, the, the hours that I spent with him, and when all of a sudden then I didn't spend a lot of time with him. I saw him regularly for about maybe three or four years when I first moved to L.A., maybe not even that long, maybe, maybe only like maybe two years regularly. Um, from like 2004 to 2006, I saw quite a lot of him in that, at that time. And um, he was never boring. He was always the nicest man. And um, I do remember one kind of funny little thing. He lived in a city called Pacoima. Some of you are not familiar with Pacoima. Um, it's in LA County, but it's, let's just say, not a nice place to live. There's nary a tree around. It's hot, it's flat, especially, you see how I'm dressed today, we're well into the 100 degrees outside now that it's going on July of 2022. But George lived in Pacoima in the same house for, I'm, I wanna say, about 60 years, and uh, people ask him sometimes, you know, why do you live there? He said, oh, it's my home. You know, I've always had my home that I bought there a long time ago in the late 50s. And he said, it's just where I've lived ever since I was 30 years old or whatever. He said, well, why do you stay there? Like with all that crime and the people and the, you know, the drugs and everything. He said, well, I join them. Now, I don't know if he joined them in the, in the usage of illicit substances. That's not for me to say, and I don't even know if he did it. But the, the thing I'm driving at here, and the narrative that I'm leading up to here with this narrative, <laughs> the comment I'm leading up to is George was such an egregious sort of person that he would talk freely to anyone of any walk of life, no matter how maybe dangerous or whatever that they might have been. And he made friends with them. 
and he lived 86 years, so it wasn't like he got killed by any of them. Um, these are, you know, these people who are far more troubled. You know, he wasn't troubled, but he, uh, you know, these people who he lived amongst were. You know, these people who are, you know, dealing on the street corners or whatever. But he loved to talk to anybody, no matter where they were in life, from anywhere from, you know, a scholarly scholar all the way down to the, to the bottom. And he would go to conventions sometimes. Um, he came to our two Twilight Zone conventions, but he went to other ones, including the two that were on the, held on the East Coast that were organized by Herman Darbeck. And, you know, I remember Herman at the time said, you know, George needs to be at these things. You know, he needs to be at the, the East Coast conventions as well and made arrangements for that to happen. So I could tell, I'll interject a few little anecdotes. I'll tell a couple stories here as I do these two videos, uh, kind of as I go along. Um, but I could, t just like George could talk for days about, you know, physics and, you know, what it meant to be alive and what it meant to be human. Um, you know, I could talk a lot about George as well, but I do want to talk about his episodes. So the first ones that he did, the four of us are dying and also execution, both from the first season, and both of which were not written completely by him. He sold, those were his first two sales to Twilight Zone, and he tells the story, or told the story. You know, he said, I never really had an agent in those days. He said, I had a guy uh, who I worked with who was an agent who said, well, I'm not going to make any contracts with you, but if you can find something, you know, that I might submit your work to, um, you know, I'll, I'll do the agenting for you and on your behalf. And he said, but you're not going to be one of my clients. I think that eventually changed with time, and he had to because he became a rather big name at one point. But in the beginning, he had nothing. And he even said, you know, my wife Lola and I and our kids, we started out from a truly penniless beginning, which, you know, and eventually that all changed. But The Four of Us Are Dying was his first sale to uh, Twilight Zone, to Cayuga Productions. Um, and Rod Serling bought it, and as he described it, Rod stuck a new car under the windshield that I'd written with this story, and he said, when it first aired, you know, I saw my name based on a story by George Clayton Johnson in the credits. He said, I was absolutely overwhelmed. So, he had bragging rights at that point. point. Finally, something with his name on it was, you know, once you got the fir your first credit, and especially the second, third, fourth, then you become somebody. So he became somebody with Twilight Zone, just like Earl Hamner did. And I think Earl Hamner, Hamner's The Hunt, which George also revered and always said how much he liked it, he said, you know, I only saw that episode one time, but, you know, like me, that was the thing that put Earl on the map in Hollywood. So The Four of Us Are Dying is really, as most people know, without telling the story, the whole story again of the episode, um, it's about basically a very simple sort of premise. A man can change his face just by, you know, thinking about it. When he has to change his face, he changes his face. He goes, this man goes from Arch Hammer to Johnny Foster to Virgil Sterry to Andy Marshak. Four completely different people played by four virtuoso actors. Harry Towns, Ross Martin, Philip Pine, and Don Gordon. And... He, you know, he goes, they go from one person to the next, and ultimately it's, you know, the Arch Hammer, who is, I guess that you might call him the title character, or the, uh, the main character. It was, in the end, the last shot that you see of them dying after Peter Bracco shoots Don Gordon, you know, you see this dissolving, lap dissolving of the one to the other, one to the one, two, three, four, and the last space is Harry Towns again, who we started the story with and who we end to see him close his eyes for the last time. Um, so it was really, um, the, George's story was very good, but Rod Serling brought it, of course, to a whole new level And the with, with the teleplay. And the last scene, especially the last sequence with Don Gordon and Peter Bracco as Andy Marshak, who was a boxer, and his father, played by Peter Bracco, um, George did not write really any of that. That was Rod Serling's creation, and George later told me, he said, I like what Rod, how Rod ended it, because the way I ended it, with a guy with the gasoline fuel pump, who runs into this guy, this old adversary at a gas station, he, he curls the gas pump down on his head. <laughs> Seems like a weird way to die, doesn't it? I guess it's not impossible, a gas, a, you know, the nozzle of a gas pump could kill somebody if it hit him right in the neck or right in the jugular or something like that. But, 
he said, I like what Rod did with it much better, and it just worked. And um, as I say, Don Gordon and Peter Bracco really played that especially well. Of course, they were all good. Ross Martin was the great Ross Martin, and Harry Towns, who was also in Shadow Play, and Philip Pine, who uh, was also played a much nicer man in The Incredible World of Horace Ford. So that was George's first story. And let's not leave out Ms. Beverly Garland, who played the torch pianist, the torch singer in the, uh, in the lounge when, um, when Harry Towns morphs into Ross Martin, going from, from um, Arch Hammer into Johnny Foster, who was known for abandoning his women. But the scene between with Ross, Ross Martin and Beverly Garland where they're at the table is quite good. Quite, quite good. And that can, of course, be attributed to good direction. And John Brom was one of the best directors on Twilight Zone. Did 12 segments of Twilight Zone. So a wonderful start of, uh, eight, of eight for George Clayton Johnson. And then the second was Execution, um, starring um, none other than the professor from Gilligan's Island, soon to be, uh, Russell Johnson, playing Professor Mannion, who is a guy who brings a guy into the future, the first time traveler in, uh, who gets brought to the first traveler in time who gets brought from 1880 in Wyoming, where in fact George Clayton Johnson was born, into the future, into New York. And um, he realizes you know, that he's brought really the wrong guy, and the guy is none other than Albert Salmi, who was one of the greatest character actors there ever was um, you know, to work um, in the medium of television. And even before that, he had a long history of, of uh, working in the theater. He was always by, already, by that time, a very distinguished actor. And uh, he'd been in uh, Bang the Drum Slowly, this live television, um, I think it was Playhouse 90 with Paul Newman. So even by that point, he was a very distinguished guy from the theater and live television. And then he was playing, you know, he was like six foot three and he played these roughnecks. And he played Joe Caswell, this outlaw, to a, a Jesse James, I think, Jesse James type of guy. Played him to a T. Now, unfortunately, execution kind of gets a bad rap because of one particular review, and I won't say who wrote the review, but they got a, they were all wet on it. And uh, it just, it, it's, it's too bad, really. The script really was, was quite well, well written. The thing that was kind of weak about it, though, the one element that was kind of weak, and apparently this reviewer just decided to throw stones at the whole episode because of it, was the last scene after Joe Caswell, after having gone out and ventured into the city, returns to the laboratory of Professor Mannion, who now Russell Johnson is dead. And when, from when he you know, attacked him, you know, this wily guy, this wily guy from, who traveled through time, you know, he refuses to go back. He's like, no, 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 you're not sending me back in the you know, time machine again. He said, I've been to hell, mister, I'm not going back again. So now he's wandered back into the laboratory and finds this burglar who's played by this short little, like, Italian boxer type guy um, who ends up killing him with the dra these drape cords, and it's utterly unconvincing. And then what happens is this, this burglar wanders into the time machine, and uh, it activates and sends him, him back to the noose where Joe Caswell originally was, and the people now back in 1880, it's like, oh, oh my dear God. You know, this this episode was very well produced, though. It was it was very. It could have been maybe a little bit better in in, in a few places, especially at the end. But it came off exceedingly well, if for, none, uh, for no other reason than Russell Johnson did a fabulous job in his um, appearance in the first act as the professor. Before there was a professor Roy Hinckley at Gilligan's Island hadn't even been thought of yet. And then of course Albert Salmi, who got on, the, who had two more parts on Twilight Zone in A Quality of Mercy. And then a big, substantial, one-hour-long role in of late, I think, of Clifford Bill um, in the fourth season. So those were George's first two. And I'll get into, I might have to break this into three episodes because there's so much I want to say about George, but I can't make these videos too long or else they just don't upload properly. So I'll end it here and pick up another one.